Great. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining Park's first disease task team webinar. This is management of North American herpetofaunal diseases. So my name is Michelle Chrisman and I'm with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and I'm the federal agency's coordinator for Park Partners in Amphibian Reptile Conservation. And with me today is Carrie Wickstead of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies who is the state agency's coordinator for Park and she's also managing the tech for today's webinar. So thank you, Carrie. So we are pleased to kick off uh, Park's webinar series with this general overview presentation of North American herpetofaunal diseases, which is intended to lead into more specific webinars on selected topics. So our goal with the webinar series is to help connect science and management action by providing information to land and natural resource managers. And so we welcome input and feedback throughout the series. All right, um, and then before I introduce our speakers today, we have a little bit of housekeeping. So um, the webinar is being recorded and we will um, be posting it later on Parks Disease Task Team web webpage. Um, captioning is also available. So please click, click on the CC button labeled live trans transcript at the bottom of your screen to enable or disable those captions. And then all attendees will be muted until the Q&A session at the end. Questions can be asked via the chat during the presentation or at the end during the Q&A session. Um, Dee Dee Olson is also with us and she is a research ecologist with the US Forest Service and longtime member of PARC and the disease task team. And Dee Dee is gonna be monitoring the chat for questions that she may be able to answer. And then she'll also be collecting other questions for the Q&A session. And then finally, if you have any tech issues, please private message Carrie Wixted so she can help you out. All right, next slide. So then Carrie and I would also like to take a moment to thank Parks Disease Task Team for helping to develop a variety of products mentioned in this talk, as well as disease specific fact sheets available at the DTT website, the Disease Task Team website. We especially thank our two speakers today who are the co-chairs of the disease task team. And then um, with that, I'm now pleased to introduce our two speakers today, Drs. Katie Heyman and Dan Greer. So Katie is a wildlife veterinarian with Pennsylvania and Washington states and has specific expertise in turtle shell disease from her work with Western pond turtles in Washington. And Dan is a research biologist with USGS at the Wildlife Health Center in Madison, Wisconsin, and works on a variety of wildlife disease systems. So welcome Katie and Dan and take it away. Great, thank you, Michelle. Hopefully you can all hear me now. Um, so yeah, as Michelle mentioned, this is the first of what we hope will be a ongoing series of webinars offered by the Park Disease Task Team. And today we're going to do kind of a brief introduction, um, an overview of management of North American herpetofaunal diseases. Next slide, please. So first I'd like to just highlight for the group in case no one, you're not familiar with what the Disease Task Team is. Um, and here you'll see our um, the, the website here at the bottom and there's a whole lot of resources available at that website. Um, but the, the mission of the disease task team really is to facilitate and guide communication collaboration on herpetofaunal diseases among the various park regions, including federal state agencies, um, partners up in Canada, and other various partners. We're made up, as you see here, the list of task team members. Um, we're a really pretty broad group with a lot of representation from state agencies, academic, academia, um, and federal, federal entities as well. And so there's four main objectives that the Park uh, Disease Task Team really has, and that is to identify issues and concerns for herp diseases, and then coordinate the development of research documents and have those documents be in one single centralized online place, um, which is this website at the bottom, things like fact sheets and publications and um, various products that will be mentioned throughout this talk today. And then to help facilitate a rapid response, um, including surveillance and outreach to emerging pathogens um, of importance for herpetofaunal um, in, in North America. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is just a brief um, outline for our talk. So I'll spend a few minutes on an introduction, um, kind of outlining some basics about pathogens and disease transmission in general. And then I'll turn it over to Dan, who will go through um, some, some threats for North American herps. And then I will wrap it up with looking at, you know, kind of a very high level overview of some, some actions and management activities that, that can be um, put in place for managing the health of herpetofauna um, here in North America. Next slide. So I think this is quite pretty clear to everybody here. It's why we're here. I think most of us are very interested in herp diseases. And I think we all are very aware that they are a priority for wildlife health in general, not just diversity species and not just reptiles and amphibians. They are definitely very important for biodiversity, ecosystem health. We all know that reptiles and amphibians play a role um, and, and serve, provide ecosystem services. And so it brings us back to this concept of, of One Health, which, you know, two years into a pandemic, I think we're all pretty, you know, becoming more aware of One Health. It's become, definitely become a much more mainstream topic in the past two years. And herps and herp diseases should be a priority and are very much a part of that. Next slide. So just to cover a couple of, of basics, which I, I suspect many of you here are very aware already, but just a, a reminder, um, what is a pathogen? A pathogen is an organism that, that can cause disease. And I have you know, the four main types of pathogens here, a virus, a bacteria, a fungus, and a parasite. And parasites can be you know, the typical worms that we think of, but it can also be protozoans and other single cell entities that, um, that cause disease and serve as a, act as a parasite. Um, I, I do want to highlight in this slide that disease is a condition that can impair the normal functioning of an organism. So it tends to have um, pathogenic impacts on the organism. And the presence of a pathogen does not necessarily mean disease. We've all, you know, every, every living thing on this planet has co-evolved with pathogens. And so we all have our own, you know, suite of pathogens, which their, their presence does not mean disease. Um, a lot of times, you know, you, you may see disease when the, there's an imbalance between the pathogen and the host, or if it's an emerging pathogen, something that, you know, is novel to the host, or, you know, it's a naive host um, to that pathogen, then you may end up seeing disease. But it is just really important, especially when you're thinking about surveillance plans and, and um, you know, surveying the, the landscape for pathogens, that finding a pathogen may not mean that the disease is present. It can still be extremely important. Um, like if we were to find bees out um, in North America, that would be extremely important, and the disease would most likely be, you know, also be found. But it is important to keep keep in mind that difference, right, between just finding a pathogen and also a disease. Next slide, please. And so modes of transmission of those pathogens, and again, I think this is probably you know, bio 101 review for, for most of us, but there's a variety of different ways that um, uh, pathogens can be transmitted. Aerosol, I think at this point, we're very familiar with in this you know, picture of somebody coughing, uh, inhalation of droplets. It's one of the main ways that we know COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 is spread. So I think, again, it's, it's pretty, pretty well understood by most of us. Uh, contact can be direct or indirect. It can be an insect bite that's a, a vector borne to a bite. It can be touching, you know, open sores or something or touching a contaminated surface that would then lead to oral and or ingestion. Um, and then the vector borne. So, and I think the, these, these are all, you know, the four basic modes of transmission definitely apply to amphibians and reptiles as well. Next slide, please. And so the components of transmission is, you know, what, how do we know, or how can we think about when a pathogen being present may end up causing disease? And it's this trifecta, um, which we have represented here with this, this triangle. So for a disease to occur, you have to have the pathogen present, you have to have an appropriate host, but you also need to have the right environment. So if one of these three um, things are missing, then you may, you're very likely not to have disease, right? So if you have a pathogen, but then you have an inappropriate or a, a host that is not susceptible, 
in the environment, you're probably not going to end up with a disease. But that can still be incredibly important when we're dealing with um, herpetofaunal pathogens, because the pathogen that's present, even if it's not causing an issue in that population, because of there's no susceptible hosts, it might, um, it will be really important for biosecurity and the potential to then, you know, have a human move it, move that pathogen into a, a new area or a new population that would be susceptible. So keeping this in mind when you're thinking about biosecurity or pathogen transmission in general is, is really very important. Next slide. And so just a very wordy slide, <laughs> I apologize for that, but just to run through some general definitions that are um, useful when dealing or, or dealing with uh, pathogens and diseases in all species really. But so a vector uh, is a living agent that can carry and transmit a pathogen to another living organism. An endemic disease would be a disease that is then maintained in a particular area or a particular population versus an emerging disease, which would be one that is recently appearing within a population or that we know the incidence and or geographic range is, is changing. And then a reservoir would be the habitat in which a pathogen would normally live, grow, can multiply. This could be an environment. It could also be the host, a, a, you know, a host population. And then a fomite, I think, is a really important thing to keep in mind, especially when dealing, again, with biosecurity protocols. But a fomite can be, it's typically an inanimate object, so an object that can carry a pathogen. So like your clothes, your tires, um, forks, you know, things that, or tools that you may be using to um, measure, say, a salamander or something, um, that can serve as a fomite and move a pathogen between populations or between individuals. Okay, next slide. Okay, and I think this is where I hand it over to Dan. Great, so now I'm going to transition into um, listing and describing um, specific diseases, threats, uh, and management concerns that are out there. Um, so these are topics and issues that, that people like Katie and I think about a lot. Um, so my goal here isn't going to be to try to tick through a long list um, of, disease names and herb species that they, get, they infect. Uh, my goal here is going to be to present um, some pathogens and diseases in three general categories, endemics, emerging diseases, and threats on the horizon to give an overview of, um, an overview of what's out there, but I'm going to leave many, many details um, for other seminars to get into. And then as if running um, through the doom and gloom of, of uh, things that can kill herbs isn't depressing enough, um, I'm also going to point out a few examples of how herp diseases interact with other major um, herptile health and management concerns, um, globalization, climate change, and invasive species to highlight how um, to address these threats, we generally must take multiple threats into consideration. So first, uh, the endemics. So these are pathogens and diseases that we have recognized and have been relatively well studied and maybe even actively managed over the last 10 to 15 years without any major changes in the threats or impacts they cause. They occur, um, from a North American perspective, they generally occur widely and we, that's, that's the herpetofauna biologists and managers, um, are living with the threats and the impacts they cause. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're harmless or don't warrant any management attention. The first of these is Atricochytrium dendrobidatus, um, or BD, which is a fungal pathogen of amphibians that has caused uh, severe impacts to frogs and toad species by causing mass mortalities, um, impacting populations, and likely has been the cause of several um, species extinctions globally. Uh, the next is rhinovirus, uh, which includes several related viral species that infect a range of uh, aquatic hosts um, ranging from fish to herpetofauna, um, but that has also has major disease impacts uh, in larval anurans, larval salamanders, as well as turtles. Um, and last one I'm going to point out here are amphibian malformations and deformities that are often, but not exclusively, caused by trematode parasites. Um, so frogs with extra or missing limbs or legs attached in the wrong places were, were one of the really first concerning attention grabbing. Um, herpetofauna diseases that really brought attention to uh, disease as a major threat and a cause of amphibian declines um, really more than 20 years ago now. 
Um, to put this another way, these are diseases that are um, pretty likely to show up in most herpetology or wildlife management textbooks these days. Um, but because I, you know, I, because I call these endemic, that doesn't mean they're static or they can be ignored. They're always changing. Um, and so one major reason they're changing is uh, their threat is that um, globalization of, of herpetofauna um, through trade and captive and wild animals moves hosts and pathogens all over the world. Um, the, every continent is connected through the trade network of um, herpetofauna. Um, and we have seen and are starting to really understand the consequences of global movement of herps and pathogens. A science paper from a few years ago was able to use whole genome sequencing and contact tracing to reconstruct evidence of how BD has been moved across and within multiple continents through trade um, in a variety of different herp taxa on the time scale of a, of a decade or less. And to continue using BD as an example, um, climate change is starting to cause all sorts of ecological changes and herps and their diseases are going to have direct impacts from the warming world. In herp disease systems, hosts and pathogens are temperature dependent. Um, and these will be among the first systems to really be impacted by climate change just because of the change, just because of how the thermal biology is going to change in the warming world. So this map um, shows predictions based on temperature changes um, that the thermal conditions of, of, for the fungus, BD, that it likes to live in will begin to reach higher latitudes and higher elevations under warming climate scenarios. Um, but it's not always, it's not that simple as just projecting temperature changes because um, these threats will be interacting with everything else that climate changes touches like land use change um, and habitat change. The next category we put herp diseases into is emerging pathogens and diseases. Um, these are often um, characterized because they're extant or occur nearby in a region of interest, maybe where you manage your state, um, your country, your ecoregion, um, but probably don't occur everywhere. Um, likely they've been documented causing disease um, and they may be increasing in range or disease severity, uh, but there's much uncertainty in the extent or host range um, and severity of impacts. Um, so these include diseases and pathogens, some of which might be fairly well known, um, like snake fungal disease, which I'm going to call out as an example here in a second. But um, likely many of these like Perkinsia parasitism, bunioviruses, endomyces, pentosomiasis are um, limited to the world that, that Katie and I work in live at. So to give an example of what emerging disease looks like, I'll highlight, I, I'll highlight snake fungal disease. It's caused by a fungal pathogen, Ophidiomyces ophidiocola, um, that infects the epidermis of a wide range of North American snake species. It causes skin lesions and disease that can range from uh, mild to extremely se severe and disfiguring. Um, snake fungal disease was first discovered in rattlesnakes in, uh, in the central and eastern U.S. in, in 2008 and 2009. Um, subsequent monitoring and surveillance has de detected um, snake fung fungal disease throughout the eastern U.S. Um, and with increasing frequency so much that I had to make the dots on my map smaller. Um, and by 2019, um, Snake fungal disease has been identified um, in several Western states and nearly everywhere we look. Um, but I said, but as, I, as I said, there's plenty of uncertainty and questions um, where the answers to those questions have important management implications, um, such as whether the fungus that causes snake fungal disease has truly spread continent-wide in 10 years, um, whether it has occurred, always occurred everywhere, um, and it's only showing up because we're looking for it, or whether there are also changes in snake populations, the pathogen itself, or the environment that make, that's making disease apparent. And as a characteristic of, of a lot of emerging diseases, we don't have good answers for these, unfortunately. Finally, we have the threats on the horizon. Um, these are threats that are, are often have been identified elsewhere with herpetofauna, sometimes that's in captive settings. Um, from a North American perspective, these are, are usually don't exist yet in North America, or we don't think they exist yet. Um, but they come with massive uncertainty. Um, that includes where they're coming from, what species at risk, where is the risk, 
And even is there a risk from these? Um, but these threats um, also provide a unique um, opportunity for proactive management. Um, and so I'm gonna use um, B cell or Bacteroquicotrinum salamander borens as an example um, because it's been a recent focus and I think really a rare and unique example of where um, the North American wildlife disease and management community has been able to take some proactive steps. So B cell is related to BD. It's a fungal pathogen um, in the same genus. And it was only recently discovered because it was causing severe disease and population crashes in wild fire sal salamanders in Western Europe. Uh, subsequent investigation strongly suggests that it was introduced into Europe through the, the global trade of captive amphibians from Asia. Um, things like these brightly colored um, fire-bellied newts and fire-bellied toads, they're, they're beautiful creatures, they're popular pets, um, but they also have been identified as carriers of B cell. That means for North America, um, there is a, a, severe, a severe threat because there's been a documented um, potential introduction route and also the, the potential for massive consequences to native um, salamander and newt species. And not just to the, the, the North American herpetofauna species themselves, um, but as well to biodiversity overall because North America is the hotspot for global salamander diversity. You know, that's a big scary threat. But so far, we don't think B cell is in wild North American amphibians. So there's a chance to do something about it proactively. The North American response to B cell is, um, I think, very unique in the wildlife disease world because we so rarely can be proactive. Usually, we're chasing the problem after we've observed the consequences, the, the death, the loss of um, populations or mortality. Shortly after the discovery of B cell in Europe, the North American B cell task force was stood up um, as an interagency and multi-organizational group that included federal and state wildlife management agencies, um, NGOs, zoos, universities, and commercial stakeholders from the pet trade. It was set up to develop an objective decision-making process for actions in response to the B cell risk and to facilitate coordination and communication among um, all stakeholders. So I'm going to call out a few examples that include the um, initial regulatory surveillance and research rounds of BSAL. Um, because I, again, I'm going to emphasize that I think this is a unique um, and so far uh, successful example, I'll say that cautiously, <laughs> in the wildlife disease world. Um, and I'll note um, the examples I'm highlighting are, are primarily US-centric because that's where um, I work, uh, but there are many international efforts going on to address B cell that I just don't have the, the time or scope to, to address today. Um, so first, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service took the threat of B cell extremely seriously and quickly developed interim regulations under the Lacey Act to list over 200 species of salamanders that were known at the time to be susceptible to B cell as injurious species. So what these regulations mean, it, is that there were strict permanent requirements placed on the importation of salamanders, captive salamanders into the United States. Uh, and it worked as intended. Um, before and shortly after the discovery of B cell, there were 100 to 200,000 um, live salamanders imported into the US each year. I mean, most of which were species that were con considered um, or identified as carriers or susceptible to B cell. After the interim regulation went into effect, um, only about 500 live salamanders per year are imported into the US now. Um, and that's only under a tightly regulated permitting system. Next, a massive question about when B cell um, uh, was whether B cell was already here in North America after it had been discovered in Europe. Um, that seems like a relatively straightforward piece of information, but the answer has massive implications for what management strategies can be used to address B cell. Um, in the US, the USGS Amphibian Research and Monitoring Initiative led a, a surveillance effort with many, many partners involved to go out and sample salamanders and newts in the wild in the US. Um, after over 11,000 swabs at 600, more than 600 sites in 35 states, we did not detect B cell. And we can at least confirm that in the, the higher risk areas that we focused on. Um, and so that increased the confidence that B cell 
um, isn't here yet, but it's still a long way from being definitive. And that, um, that remaining uncertainty brings me to the last point um, that especially for emerging diseases or threats on the horizon, um, we are acting and reacting to these herpetofaunal disease threats in a shifting knowledge landscape. So two exam examples are ongoing research into the host range of BSL. Um, not long after the interim US regulations on imp importation of salamanders went into effect, researchers in Europe detected B-cell on a fire belly toad in the captive pet trade. Um, and uh, these animals are very popular in the pet trade um, because they're bright, they're beautiful, they're, they're enjoyable to keep and have around. Um, but if you recall the import chart I showed before, there are um, as many as tens to even hundreds of thousands being imported into the US each year. And this highlights one of the challenges of management under uncertainty. Um, and these, as of yet, these um, non-salamander species have not been formally considered in a regulatory framework. Um, then there's a very recent discovery um, led by the research group of Matt Gray at the University of Tennessee, including uh, his students in a really outstanding multi-university research group um, that Cuban tree frogs are susceptible to infection and even disease from B cell and captive infection tracts. Um, and, you know, yikes, here we are, we have a really significant shift in how we are thinking about the B cell threat from salamanders to a lot of other amphibian species. Um, so far, this has only been demonstrated in um, the lab. Um, but it does bring another massive management concern in here in that Cuban tree frogs are, are very invasive species in the Southern US. So double yikes. Um, I can only imagine that those of you who deal with invasive species can imagine the, the, the increase in complexity of trying to navigate increasing um, invasive species issues with a high consequence disease thrown into the mix or vice versa. Um, so that's maybe not a super fun way to wrap up um, my section, but at least I'm done going with the overview of all this disease and pestilence. Um, but before I hand it back to Katie, I do want to acknowledge that I think, the, again, the response to BSA has been a really positive development in being able to address and manage um, a wildlife disease threat proactively. Um, and that's really due to a massive amount of work um, by many, many people who initiated and stood up the North American B cell Task Force um, as a way to um, coordinate all these activities in the, the research and management realm as well, keep um, communication up. Great, thanks, Dan. So now that we have covered um, from Dan the you know these threats that are endemic emerging and on the horizon, what can we do? What, what actions and or management can be done um, to try and tackle that? I think, and as Dan mentioned, the, the B cell as an example is a really great one of being proactive. Um, and it, it is pretty unique in the, in the wildlife disease world of being that proactive. And so I think keeping that in mind as we move forward will be really valuable and hopefully um, it becomes you know, a, an indicator or um, an example of what we can do with in, in future events. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So what can we do? And I'm going to spend the last few minutes of this talk um, given kind of a, a really high level review of some actions that can be undertaken to help reduce the, the risk of spreading pathogens and disease in North American herptofauna. Uh, we'll start with looking at some biosecurity and policy level concepts and then surveillance and or rapid response uh, with, and will you hit the, this is, thank you, with the goal of increasing, um, you know, population community and overall ecosystem resilience. And this goes back to one of the very first slides in this presentation, right, of that, you know, herptofauna in North America are a key component of our ecosystems. And, um, you know, we have to have them in order to have ecosystem resilience, resilience and, and, you know, enhancing and maintaining the biodiversity in North American wildlife. Next slide, please. So a really super duper brief introduction to biosecurity, and this is um, something that we're talking about 
uh, having as one of the next webinars. So I think we, we could spend hours and hours and hours and hours on biosecurity. Um, and I've kind of distilled it down to one, one slide, which is not fair to biosecurity and its importance. Um, but I think that, you know, it's, it's really key when we're dealing with um, wildlife diseases and wildlife pathogens, but especially with herpetofauna diseases and pathogens to consider biosecurity when we're doing our field work. Um, there's a standard between site biosecurity that includes, you know, cleaning out your field gear and taking, um, dealing with large equipment, which this, there's this really great uh, Julian et al. 2020 paper. Um, it could also include water draws for, for welfare, right? Like, so if we're pulling water out of one lake and going and dumping it on another site, what, what pathogens are we potentially spreading by doing that? And then there's enhanced biosecurity practices for rare species. And that might include, you know, pathogen-free areas and how to do uh, field work within a site, right? If we have a, a site that's interconnected by uh, water or waterways, how do you define that risk and how do you prevent or reduce the risk of spreading a pathogen within a population potentially, especially for very rare species. And there's um, a paper, Olson, Heyman et al. that just came out in 2021 um, that looks at, at concepts around this enhanced biosecurity uh, for, for rare species. And I think it's really important overall to not transport wild animals or water between sites and to make sure your gear is disinfected between sites. And of course, I think we all know, don't turn it loose if you have a, if you have a pet um, reptile or amphibian, don't turn it loose. Next slide, please. Potential policy level solutions, and this is something uh, the disease task team, you know, kicks around and discusses, uh, you know, what if we can make recommendations or what we would put forth. And then we also, you know, some of the products that we produce are geared towards potential, you know, some some level of policy solution. So education campaigns and signage is uh, is really can be really really useful and really beneficial. I think that there's a lot of states that have, have taken this. Um, you know, taking this into account, there's a really great BD educational campaign and signage that goes, you know, it came out of Alaska that um, I think a lot of places could really benefit from, from putting such signage out, right? So that people walking their dog or, or where they may read a sign and say, oh, hey, maybe I shouldn't let my dog swim here, or maybe I should wash my dog off before he goes and swims in another pond. Um, you can, you know, play, restrictions can be put in place for protected areas if we know we have um, really high risk species in certain areas or potentially endangered species in certain areas. And then again, the enhanced biosecurity protocols and policies, I think is really important for field, field staff and for moving um, equipment around and conducting field work of, of various types. And then guidance in general, ex very explicit guidance in state and federal permits, be, the, um, be them research permits or scientific collection permits. Um, I think there can be really great guidance provided in those types of, of documents that can um, you know, help reduce the risk of, of pathogens and diseases in North American herpetofauna. Next slide, please. So I think we're probably all very aware of the importance of surveillance and monitoring. And it, it is absolutely critical. We, we, can't, we can't know if a pathogen is present if we're not sur or conducting surveillance for it, right? And I think this is one of the things that we often struggle with when we first detect a pathogen and um, something like snake fungal disease or amidomyces and Western pond turtles. It's hard to know if that's an emerging pathogen or if that's a pathogen that's been around for a really long time and we just start looking for it. Um, or we're finding it because we've just started looking for it. So ongoing surveillance is, is really, really important. Um, and this Olson et al. paper really highlights this here with, you know, you can see the detected versus not detected. These not detective sites are as important as the, the detected sites. And so I think it's, again, just, you know, keeping that in mind when we're doing field work. And if you have the opportunity to collect samples for surveillance efforts, um, that, that can lead to baseline level information that can help with um, evidence-based management for herp diseases. And I do want to highlight here the herp disease alert system um, is something that the park disease task team monitors. And there's this email address right here. So if you're out and you see a, a sicker or dead um, amphibian or reptile, you can email this email um, and it will go to the, the disease task team. And then we have a list of contacts from all of our state, federal, and even provincial partners up in Canada 
that we would then reach out to to say, hey, we have this report of uh, a group of sick or dead frogs. Here's the information we received. And we just provide it to the, the entity or the agency that would then you know, be able to potentially respond and or get samples. Next slide, please. So responding, rapid response in terms of when a pathogen is first detected is, is absolutely critical. Um, I think the, the timing you know, can, can make or break a response, honestly. I think having a plan in place prior to um, a detection is really important. Is the plan going to be con to contain it? Is the plan to eradicate it? Um, what is the chain of command? What labs are gonna be used for testing? What samples need to be collected? All of this type of information needs to be in place in a plan prior, hopefully, ideally prior to um, a pathogen being detected. That way, if it is detected or if you know, suspected, um, what, what will be done in a stepwise uh, coordinated fashion is, is already well documented and laid out. And I think that there's a lot of really great information out there from the, the BSAL group, um, basically outlining this exact type of plan, right? And it could be applied to many different pathogens, not, not just B-cell. Next slide, please. And again, just to, to reiterate, right, that our goal here is to manage healthy populations and to maintain the, you know, the biodiversity and, and the healthy populations of North American herptofauna. And so I think that there are preventative actions that can go into place, policies like we saw with BSAL, uh, biosecurity plans and, and dealing with biosecurity and decontamination efforts, having response plans in place prior to detection, um, kind of, you know, in the expectation that it will be detected at some point, uh, given globalization and, and the pet trade and the movement of wildlife around. So having those response plans already in place. And again, the goal is, is to have robust, resilient populations that can withstand these pressures and stressors. And the um, this document here that I have linked here, the, the model criteria and implementation guidance for prior, priority amphibian and reptile conservation areas is a really useful tool um, that's available. Next slide. And I think with that, I'll say uh, stay tuned for future seminars. I, I alluded to the next one being a biosecurity um, webinar, which we are still in, in the plant, very much in the planning phases of, but um, know the utility and the importance of covering biosecurity and hopefully prior to the spring field season. Um, some other topics that we've discussed is response planning and how you would deal with that first detection. So what the heck, you know, what the heck do you do when and if you do detect you know, snake fungal disease in a new state or B cell. Um, so ha having a webinar focused on that. And then agency interactions with disease where it might overlap between captive animals, rehabilitation, um, potentially head starting, reintroductions and translocations. And then other topics of interest. We'd love to hear from this group um, here today of, of any other topics of interest that you would like to have us address. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and with that, I think we'll we'll open it up for questions. And I will say that we're gonna um, we can accept questions if you want to raise your hand and ask a question um, verbally, or you can also just put questions in the chat. We'll be monitoring both. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm catching up with the chat, um, and I see one of the first ones that um, Sarah Tangren had a question about um, doing risk surveillance, I think particularly in an invasive species setting. Um, there are some resources as far as surveillance regarding detecting um, prevalence of disease and designing, um, designing surveillance programs. Um, on the park disease website, there's a link there. And the concepts of that are very similar to um, probably what you're interested in applying. So if you're interested in looking, searching, um, I'd suggest uh, looking in the literature for occupancy sampling. Um, yeah, that, that's probably the, the search term that's gonna get you the, the methods most directly for what you're interested in. 
while people are still kind of getting their questions together to either enter into the chat or raise their hand. Um, Dee Dee, if you could maybe uh, read out any questions for um, Katie and Dan to address. And Katie and Dan, if you pull any directly from the chat, if you could read the question out loud before answering, that'd be great. Thanks. Okay, this is Dee Dee. Um, so one of the first questions that came in the chat was from Sarah Tangren um, for Dan. Um, and so Dan, regarding risk surveillance, is there a specific statistical method that you can recommend for determining how many surveillance sites are needed to determine the presence absence of an invasive species uh, to within a specific level of assurance, like 95% confidence? Um, I've been trying to Google this, but I don't know the correct terminology. Yeah, sorry, that's the, that's what I just, just. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Without reading the question first, hopefully just do this, yeah. All right, sorry, I was reading the chat while you were answering, so I missed what you said. <laughs> And then did you address um, um, Phil's, uh, the man of deer's comment on um, a template? Um, it says, Katie et al, it would be helpful if your team could serve up some example template language for state and federal biologists to include in our scientific collection and research permits. So um, maybe Phil can um, expand on what he would like to see in, in permits. Is that for biosecurity? Um, is it for reporting of results of um, surveillance? Hi, Dee Dee, it's Philip here. No, I was thinking about biosecurity. I just think it's really, if we remember to put it in as consistently as we should, we tend to, I imagine the different states and biologists and staff, even within a state, are have kind of pretty loosey-goosey language that is not consistent and perhaps not comprehensive enough. Yeah, I think that's that's a really that's a great suggestion, Philip, to have some, you know, some standardized language. And I think that's something we can put on the disease task teams action items to try and address something like that and provide it for, for state's use. So Philip, do you already have something that you've put into your state guidance? Um, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, it's pretty much the way I characterized it. At least I shouldn't speak for everybody, I suppose. My staff and, and Maine, we, we just, we don't put as much emphasis and attention to scientific collection permits and um, research permit conditions as we probably should. And if we put biosecurity language in there, it might just be something to that effect, you know, make sure you're biosecure, et cetera. We might, but that doesn't, for a lot of the readers of those and users of those, those permits, they're looking, if they're going to implement something, it needs to be very specific and we need to ask them to do something very specific you know, th this, this bleach solution at this concentration for these uh, materials, boots, tires, et cetera, that kind of level of specificity. So I think what you're talking about is between field site biosecurity. And I see the, the language in my own permit when I um, apply for that in Oregon. And when I, I see it, I'm, I'm glad it's there, but I, I feel like it's not very enforceable. Um, but the, the question gets raised very quickly is, um, are we going to be recommending gloves for handling and changing of gloves between individuals? Um, so that gets to more within site biosecurity, um, especially for people that are working on health issues or where there's a suspected um, disease causing pathogen in those populations. And um, for North America, we have um, some conflict that emerges when uh, we, we talk, talk about mandating um, gloves. And, um, and so I think that level of biosecurity needs more development and we, we need some more guidance on when that would be necessary for implementation. 
Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks. It, it, so maybe just go to at least the common lowest denominator language. Like you got at a minimum, the whole community pretty much agrees on X and Y kind of thing. Even that would be an improvement over some of the conditions that I've seen. So I think we can um, we can draft some of this in our park disease task team and then do some outreach to states to see if it's sufficient and, and get feedback from um, those, especially those herb experts that are, are on our contact list um, as being the, the leads for health issues for herbs. Yeah, I was just going to add to that, that we can also do some preliminary outreach to see what some of the states and federal permits already contain and to see like if there's general language that we could, you know, offer up recommendations for adoption for states that don't have that or or federal offices that are not using um, permits or language in their permits currently. Um, and then I just wanted to point out because it's, it's related to this conversation um, that Wendy had some conversations about or some comments in the chat about um, moving beaver and other, other things. And I think if we do some outreach to the states um, regarding permits, we could also maybe ask a few questions about other activities um, that are happening like um, translocation of other wildlife um, and, and other fomites. And just before we move on to the next question, I also want to point out that Greg Lips posted in the chat um, the Northeast Park product about disinfection protocol. So that's one of the products that we often refer folks to. So that's something to check out. Thanks, Greg. And I think there's some products that um, um, several of the, the regional working groups of park, including um, Southeast Park has a pretty good uh, selection of fact sheets and, and information on various pathogens. Um, and they may also have, I think there's a video um, on the park website um, demonstrating some biosecurity implementation as well. Um, maybe we could pull those together in a, a more cohesive fashion. Um, and I'm also reminded, and I think Eric Castro is on the line on the video today somewhere, um, that he has put out a, um, a one pager flyer to um, highlight uh, some of the pathogens that, that we're dealing with, especially the chytrids that um, can alert beyond, um, you know, <laughs> um, the chorus of herpetologists that, that we often speak to, but to the public that um, there is public biosecurity that also can be conducted, especially at sensitive field sites. And um, that, that flyer uh, is available at the Park DDT website. And to go along with that, Eric had a question. As land and resource managers in various regions begin to inform the public about those emerging pathogens, he wants to know if PARC has a standardized PowerPoint presentation template or something to uh, most accurately educate the public. Yeah, in that, I was just kind of thinking about uh, a lot of what Philip was saying, you know, just making sure that we had, you know, all of the, uh, the uh, disinfection protocols correct, um, you know, because in, in the process of making that, uh, that one page flyer uh, for the public, you know, it, it came through, there were a couple uh, iterations in, that, in order to be able to make sure that uh, uh, the research cited was correct. Um, and, uh, and that we use the, I mean, instead of one in five, you know, one in 10, um, or instead of one in 20, one in 10, you know, so just, uh, just nice ways to be able to uh, standardize our language so that uh, um, as we, uh, it just would help, I feel, facilitate the, uh, getting the message out to uh, our communities. Yeah, for the, um, the resources that the, the Park Disease Task Team has are primarily aimed at, I think people like you, biologists, um, researchers, uh, and I don't know that we have, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but don't have a whole lot of, 
information that is that is designed for the general public, people who come to to recreate, um, or you know, not, or even just recreationally look for herbs, but use use the landscapes we're concerned about. So that might I think that's a, a, a great idea, something we can put on our, our radar so that we, if, when the opportunity arises, there's, we can capture that audience as well. And perhaps, you know, you can almost crowdsource that. So I, I, just as I had done something that I was going to be able to implement locally here, and then, you know, it made its way onto the park website, you could do the same thing with, as uh, folks make their presentations about BSAL or BD in various areas. Then we can just take it and adapt it to uh, uh, um, to ours, you know, as long as it wasn't something that was, you know, copyrighted or restricted in any ways. Thanks, Eric. Um, sure. I've, I've been reading the chat, and I wonder if Matt Gray could um, speak just a second on when gloves might be recommended and. Um, add to the chat of, of the gloves. Hey, Didi, I'm sure be happy to just give my thoughts on it. Um, so I posted in the chat uh, a couple of uh, papers, um, but one referring to, you know, the risk of not changing your gloves between handling animals. And uh, there's pretty good evidence, at least with viruses, and, and I'm, I'm pretty certain this would be the case with chytrid too, because we can see chytrid can transmit within one, between animals be with just one second of contact. Is that, you know, they're shedding the pathogen, you know, through their skin, whether it's a virus or whether it's um, chytrid, and, and, and it gets on your gloves, and if you go from animal to animal to animal, um, the paper that I posted show with, showed with ronavirus that you increase the, the chance of transmission and mortality of those individuals pretty substantially um, of uninfected individuals. So uh, we just need to, I think, be aware that when we're doing field studies that, um, you know, we don't want to um, alter the, the transmission dynamics within a large population of animals by taking a few infected individuals and spreading that pathogen unnaturally through the population. So um, I think everybody should take that into consideration. And, and then I think Greg uh, um, asked about um, any concern with gloves and toxic, uh, toxic effects of gloves. And, and, and we haven't had any issues at all with, with using nitrile gloves and we've handled literally thousands of animals in laboratory across 50 plus different species with various um, experiments. And we always have control animals and almost always have 100% survival of our control animals, no negative impacts on them, um, both survival histologically, et cetera, through handling them with, with nitrile gloves. So um, since that paper back in 08, I think Scott and those published another paper walking back some of the suggestions of maybe not to use gloves. Um, I think overwhelm overwhelmingly um, folks are in support of using gloves, especially nitrile gloves, um, when you're um, doing amphibian or, 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 or herpetofaunal disease work, and ideally changing those between handling animals. I'll toss my recollection of that series of work as well, is that a lot of the toxic effects came down to the manufacturing and powders and that type of thing that get on gloves. So identifying powder-free nitrile or um, vinyl gloves, and even if, if possible, and in a safe biosecure way, giving them a rinse before you handle the, um, the animals is a good way to reduce that potentially negative effect from any manufacturing residue on the gloves. In the chat, there was another question about biodiversity from Sharon Irwin on a different topic. Um, what would you recommend for cleaning a helicopter that is landing in multiple wetlands in a very remote area? And so I'd like to um, uh, reference the, the Jim Julian et al. paper that came out in 2020 that speaks to large equipment. So there are some guidance there. Um, but there's a practicality issue that comes with something like a helicopter. And um, uh, so Olson, Hammond et al, 21, um, gave some suggestions for prioritizing uh, where you go first 
And um, so for a helicopter that is, you know, newly launched, um, going to the least likely place that has um, pathogens uh, could be important. And um, that might be at a headwater where there's um, uh, no incoming source uh, from the water transmission of pathogens, for example, and then work down slope from there. And that would be for field crews as well as helicopters. Um, and then um, a, practicality, a practicality aspect is um, pathogens could become quite endemic to um, a watershed. And you could work within a watershed without um, that biosecurity between sites. But if you're starting to skip between watersheds, that might be the trigger for um, cleaning that helicopter. Um, and so you, it, so if you go within a, um, a watershed and you have um, a disease-causing pathogen there, um, you might transmit it between locations within that watershed. But it's it's likely already um, naturally being transmitted, or it could be naturally transmitted within that watershed. So there's there's sort of rule sets that you could um, derive that um, interlace the practicality of something of, you know, washing the helicopter every time it lands. Um, but if it's hop scopping, hop, um, hop, hopping between sites within a watershed, um, I know field crews uh, may not do that between site biosecurity if they're working within a small watershed, but when they cross over between watersheds, that's when the very active field crews may do their biosecurity. So, um, so that sort of thinking could apply to large equipment like that. Thank you, Didi. There are a couple um, questions also in the chat about some terms that were used. One was from Raquel Elder, and she wanted to know, can you clarify what is considered or meant by effective surveillance from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife snake fungal disease um, surveillance person? I can tackle that, um, mostly to say that that's probably going to make it into a future seminar in detail. but. <laughs> Um, to give you my, my quick, quick take on that is that um, there's a ought to be a distinction between monitoring, which is looking for something in surveillance, which is looking for something with a some sort of action on the back end of, of whatever you find. So effective surveillance, I think, is whether or not the, um, the effort um, and the results are sufficient to take whatever action um, the surveillance is designed to trigger. And that, that can range from a lot of things, which is where, yeah, that's all, that's probably a big chunk of an, hopefully another one of our, our seminars coming up. Thank you. And there's another question from Kristen Larson. Um, she thanks you for the talk and she'd like to know where she can get more information on inclusion body disease. It was mentioned as a possible future concern. Dan, do you have, are there any USGS wildlife health bulletins or fact sheets or anything on inclusion body disease? Um, not that I know of. Yeah. Um, I would say if she wants to email me, I can help her dig up some, some references. I don't have any that I could provide off the top of my head right now. Um, if any, anyone else on this call does, please, please do. But otherwise, um, feel free to shoot me an email and I'd be happy to help with that. Thanks, Kate. So I, I just was rereading Wendy's um, note about beaver, and I was reminded that there's a paper um, that Tara Chestnut and colleagues um, tested a variety of mammals to see if um, there's, you know, transmission of BD with with mammals. And of course, it, it could be in the water if the fur is wet and the water is a type of fomite, um, but they did not detect adherence of BD to the fur of mammals. And I'll look up that paper and send it to you, Wendy, um, just so you have some more information on that 
that would be fantastic because I um I was originally thinking that how it can actually found that I can actually grow and uh so not be grow on character nice tissue or ducks and but then I got started getting really worried. So that could Okay. Well, you'll get an email from me. <laughs> yeah, and Wendy, it sounds like your audio was a little skewed. You kind of had a robot monster voice, <laughs> at least on my end. Um, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, I guess Liana heard it as well. Um, there's some additional questions in the chat, but in honor of everyone's time, I do want to say that it is five o'clock and I want to thank you all for attending and a really big thanks to our speakers for spending their time to put this together and please keep an eye out um, for a follow up email with uh, the recording. It's going to take a minimum of one to two weeks because I'll have to work on the captioning, but I'll have this information and I'll send out the additional links. And um, we'll try to hang on for a little bit more for some of these additional questions which have popped up in the chat, but we'll also try to send out some resources with that follow up as well. So thank you.